Subscribe to The Honest Critique for current affairs, movie, book, and product reviews. Also, make sure you press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the video series are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily represent those of The Honest Critique and its employees. The following video contains strong language which may be offensive to some viewers. Viewer discretion advised. Hello and welcome to a very special episode we are recording today. I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Elizabeth Pearson, who is the program lead for the Masters in Terrorism and Counterterrorism Studies at the Royal Hallway in University of London and co-director of the Conflict, Violence and Terrorism Research Centre. She's an associate fellow with the Royal United Service Institute and with the International Centre for Counterterrorism. Her research interests are gender, extremism and counter-extremism. She's out with a new book, Extreme Britain, Gender, Masculinity and Radicalization. So thank you, Dr. Pearson, for taking your time and speaking to us today. Thank you for inviting me to come and talk about Extreme Britain to the Honest Critique. So I wanted to start uh, with the book a little bit and probably we'll go into details later part. How does the book uh, Extreme Britain, uh, if you have a copy, you can show to the audience uh, uh, a copy of the book so that they know what we're talking I do about. Have a, I do have my copy. Guess what? Yeah, my um, th this is the book. Um, so I wanted to ask you that uh, your book challenge, the oversimplified notion of toxic masculinity, especially within extremist movements. Uh, what insight does it offer into the roles of both men and women in perpetuating extreme masculinities, uh, if you could put it out for our audience? Yeah, sure. So I think there's been, obviously, since 9-11, there's been a lot of focus on trying to understand why people join terrorist groups, why they join extreme movements. And, um, you know, that's more than 20 years ago, there's been a lot of evolution in the conversation since. And in the last 10 years, really, I think there's been much more of a conversation about men and gender, about masculinities and gender. And there's been, at least in popular discourse, a conversation around this idea of a crisis of masculinity, toxic masculinity, men who don't know where their place is in the world anymore, men who turn to violence, men who are a problem, men who are toxic. And if only we could solve this problem of toxic men and toxic masculinity, then we could sort out crime, we could sort out terrorism, we could sort out extremism and, and, and many other sort of crimes. Um, and I was interested in that idea because I work on gender and my work on gender is really around gender relations, gender dynamics. So um, the hierarchies, relationships between men and women, how different terrorist groups understand gender in their ideologies. Um, you know, Islamic State, for instance, recruiting women um, to be wives, to be propagandists, but in the home, to be part of that Islamic State caliphate. So I was interested also in men and what I found in, in the research, and this book comes from my PhD research that I did from um, 2014 to 2018. So the research was between 2016 and 2018. And I found, um, I found you know, that, that this picture of toxic masculinity just didn't really fit. Things were much more complex than that. And that probably sounds like a sort of a typical researchery type thing to say. It's always complicated. It's always complex. But there really wasn't one thing going on for men or for women. And I think in the book, what I really want to explore is, is that complexity and how in these two different movements that I look at. So I was talking to people in the anti-Islam far right. So what I call the radical right in the UK. And I was also talking to people who were involved in Anjem Chowdhury's Islamist group, al um, networked to it. So kind of a similar ideology to Islamic State. And, it, and indeed, Anjem Chowdhury, the leader, did go to prison for support of Islamic State whilst I was doing this research. So that was really what I wanted to do with this book. And it's fascinating. I wanted to come a little bit to the mythology part of it. And I was kind of interested because while I was reading the book, I got to know that you spoke to people uh, in those groups to understand uh, them in detail. Could you just uh, tell us a little bit about what mythologies did you employ to undercover or uncover the emergence of these extreme masculinities within groups like Al Majoreen or the English Defence League? Sure. Well, I was really focused on talking to people, so on getting that sort of 
primary data by by pe- by speaking and doing interviews with people. And there were the reason there were two reasons, I suppose, for that. And the first is that I used to be a journalist, so I used to work in radio for the BBC, and so I was really used to talking to people. And I always felt that however much you thought you knew about a situation, a story, a person, before you went to talk to them, once you got your microphone out and you were interviewing them, you know, you got a different picture, you got a different understanding. And so that was, sort of instinctively, that would be my my sort of preferred methodology. But I'm also using gender and I was using um, Connell's, um, formulation of what masculinities are, this idea of masculinities as a hierarchy. And Connell is someone who's done a lot of work um, doing interviews, doing that primary research, and really uh, using life history interviews, you know, talking to people about their whole trajectory into, you know, what, whatever activity Connell was talking to them about. And so too with other, with criminologists specifically engaged in masculinities, you know, a lot of this work is about understanding masculinities as situated in place. And that is something that scholars have sought to, you know, research through going out, talking to people in the places that matter to them. So those were the two reasons why I chose talking to people, doing these semi-structured interviews with people as the way that I was going to get data. You know, that is problematic and that raised quite a lot of challenges, both ethically and, you know, in in terms of, you you know, do I trust this data? Do I trust these people? And obviously you can't take what they're saying at face value. And also my own um, ability as a researcher to go out and do those interviews and and to get that information from those activists, because they are... Um, not very easy to access and they, they don't tend to like academics very much for kind of obvious reasons and um, they really don't like people who worked for the BBC because they don't trust the mainstream media so there was a few challenges in going out there and, and, and talking to people but I genuinely um, felt that without that empathy and I talk in the book about sort of feminist methodology methodologies of care and that desire to go and really try and empathize and stand in their shoes um, during those interviews to not suspend your views, not to be open to taking on their views, not to sympathize, but to listen and to be ready for that listening to change you and to inform your thinking in a way that might change your thinking. And, and so that there is a purpose to doing those interviews. You don't go into that research with one view that you've got from reading all the literature and come out, you know, and, and be determined, oh, this is the view that I'm going to find. You know, you've got to be open to listening to people, to their stories and recognising that they come from a different place to you and, you know, an exchange really in, in terms of, of thinking and ideas. I mean, I don't know how much of an exchange there was, but I was ready to listen to them. And this actually uh, brings me to what I want to ask you next, that uh, what you did actually is a, a great help, like, you know, commendable for a perspective because in terrorism studies, when we look at research, uh, we see very hardly perspectives coming out from the terror groups or from these uh, people who are involved in this. And that's where I want to ask you the next thing that, uh, the, your work sheds uh, intersection between misogyny and radicalization across extreme ideologies. And at most, we hear about the incel movement, uh, about how misogynistic they are. Uh, but at the onset, we don't hear a lot of conversation happening, especially within jihadist groups. Uh, and this is where uh, your work plays a very important role to bring across uh, this point. Could you explain a little bit about the intersection between how misogyny and radicalization works? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, these groups, both sets of actors that I spoke to have very problematic and very harmful views. So we've got a group of people on the one hand who believe that there is no place in not just British society, but Western society generally for Islam. They think it's harmful. They think it's oppressive. They they oppose everything about it. And they do that in gendered terms. So they have this view of Islam as um, oppressing women in particular ways. Um, And they have this view of of Islam as 
anti-gender equality, as anti-gay rights, as being um, a regressive force within British society. Now, some of the misogyny in the group is directed externally. Now, I say group, it's actually groups that I spoke to. So there were three key groups. There was the English Defence League, which pretty much doesn't really meet anymore. Um, but it was used to meet in its thousands, you know, like 10, 10 years ago or so. And Tommy Robinson was the founder of that. Then a, a political party called Britain First. They are a um, more explicitly racist group. They have, you know, ideas about the deportation, for instance, of minorities, as well as being opposed to Islam. And then another group called For Britain, which um, again had sort of po political party political aspirations, which was run by a gay woman called Anne Marie Waters. That's also defunct. So they have this this recruitment narrative around gender. So there's been um, this idea of Muslim men in particular being uh, oppressive, not just to Muslim women, but to uh, non-Muslim, and the word that the participants would use here is white. So obviously there is no, there's no contradiction between white and being Muslim. Many Muslims are white people, but in the narratives, you know, white means not Muslim. So you've got this idea of Muslim men oppressing Muslim women and Muslim men um, being sexual predators of um, non-Muslim white women in a British context. And these are really powerful mobilizing narratives. Now, there is this kind of narrative of we're going to rescue these Muslim women from, from Islam, even if they don't know that they need rescuing from it. But in line with that, there's also a real misogyny towards those women. And when I talk to people, you know, what they would, the really beginnings of their extremism was rooted in their local spaces. And it was around, you know, gender difference, different gender behaviours, different sexual norms, and, you know, centred on women's clothing, which, you know, this has been well documented in, in all the literature for some time, you know, centred on other othering women who are wearing hijab, who are wearing the burqa, and um, this is really important because when you look at nationalist narratives, not just in Britain, but, you know, all over the world, they are gendered and they're important because they mobilise men to go to war for the nation. So nation states understand the nation as almost like a family. And it is the men's job to protect their women from predator men from other groups and this is a this is not just the UK this is in many different countries so this is strongly gendered and what you get when you have the presence of other women in your space is that that kind of that narrative doesn't work anymore you can't protect your women in your space from the outsiders because the women in your space are the outsiders so there's this kind of it's a really strong gendered narrative to um, what these far-right groups in a UK context are doing. And that misogyny against those women who, who they believe are, you know, regressive, who are, who are co in contradiction to ideas of gender equality, which they understand as being completely to do with Britishness. This is really important in their narratives. And, you know, they would quite often cite... Um, you know, the former Prime Minister, David Cameron, and subsequent governments who've talked about, you know, British values and what they are and, you know, gender equality being part of those British values. So they felt quite bolstered by government rhetorics on this, um, which made sense because those rhetorics, you know, they are consistent. Um, I don't know if you want me to talk a bit about the um, the Islamists as well. Yeah, that would be great, actually, if you could bring about that perspective as well. Yeah, so, I mean, it was much, in all of, in both of these groups, you know, what I saw was that, you know, there's obvious misogyny towards the other, but there's also misogyny within their own groups as well, you know, and I, I, I detail this in some extent in the far right, and we can talk about that subsequently, but, you know, I talked to three women, two, sorry, uh, two two women leaders and one woman who had some leadership role in the English Defence League. And all of them had faced pushback from men within those groups. So these are strongly patriarchal, strongly gendered groups. And that has 
repercussions for the women who choose to be active in those groups. So now when it came to talking to uh, people who were networked into Anjum Chowdhury, it was more difficult for me. I'm, I'm not Muslim. Um, I uh, had to, basically, I, I, I talked to Anjum Chowdhury first and I went to his trial and I was sat with some of his uh, students, let's say, uh, his colleagues, his friends, in the public gallery. And, you know, I spoke to them after as I said, I'd like to talk to you for this project. And they were like, well, we'll go away. We'll talk to you. you know, we'll tell you if, if we'll talk to you. And, and they came back and said, yeah, you can talk to us, but you can't speak to any of the women. And I spoke to Anjum Chowdhury. I was like, you know, I'd like to speak to some of the women in the group. And he, you know, he, he lied and he said, oh, no, we don't have women in this group. So, you know, there is this, I would say that sort of part of misogyny is about, is a, is a tool to maintain the dominance of patriarchy, of male dominated male run systems. So in the case of talking to the Al Mahajarun participants, you know, I never broke through this, this barrier, which is it's our decision whether, you know, and for all I know, the women said we don't want to talk to her. And, you know, you can tell her that. But what came across strongly was that I was never going to get the chance to speak to those women. That decision had been made by the men for various reasons. You know, so so that was a sort of that was the, a barrier of mis misogyny in the very first place that that stopped me um, participating in the same way that I was doing in the far right. I should mention also that at the time that I was doing this research, I was able to go to far right, right demonstrations. So, you know, they had the right to demonstrate in, in the UK. The police would be there and they would, you know, they have to let the police know they're doing a demonstration. Please turn up. They police, they make sure there's no trouble. They try and make sure there's no trouble. Um, but al Mahajirun had been banned from doing public protests at this time. So I couldn't just go to a demonstration and talk to them. I had to do it like through meeting Chowdhury, going to trials, meeting them that way. So so there was an added barrier there. So it's much more difficult for me, basically, to talk to the al Mahajirun um, people. But, you know, when you also looked at, you know, how misogyny was evident, you know, and I, I quote Anjum Chowdhury in the... Um, in the book around gender values. Now, at the time, you know, it's a criminal offence to support Islamic State. So absolutely no one told me they supported Islamic State at this point in time. And they would have been idiotic to you if, if they had. But they talked about why they would like to see an Islamic State, you know, in the UK, for instance. And they talk about, you know, uh, the fact that sexual morality is non-existent in the UK. They would talk about um, women's behaviours being... Uh, having gone too far in terms of clothing, in terms of drinking, in terms of smoking, in terms of a lack of spirit, spirituality, all of this, they link to a, the lack of God, the godlessness of British life. And um, Anjan Chowdhury talked to me, he said, you know, look, you know, we've got similar gender values, but, you know, ours are about, you know, you might think that a fireman is a heroic figure, you know, who you look up to. And, you know, in in our belief system, a warrior who's protecting Muslim people, protecting Muslim women and children is the, that's our equivalent of a fireman, you know, and I quote him talking about this in the book. There's a lot of policing of women's, of women's behaviours in both movements. But when we look at al Mahajirun, you know, they're involved in Muslim patrol at one point in time. And, you know, they're going into parts of London, where people are just having a night out and essentially assaulting, being aggressively behave, behaving aggressively to stop these behaviours they don't agree with, drinking, immoral clothing, you know, and they, some of them were arrested and went to prison for this. So we've got this policing of women's behaviours, but also men's behaviours. And we see that actually in both movements. They're about forcibly changing the way that people behave. Um, you know, in the far right, they're, they're marching through Muslim areas. They are saying, you know, whose streets? Our streets. So, And it's mainly men. So there's this kind of male um, claim to these spaces. And often these were very gendered spaces. They are places where there has been um, scandals of child sexual exploitation and, and grooming, of which we have had a number in um, Britain and, and some of those grooming scandals have been specifically related to people of, you know, from one cultural background, you know, obviously child abuse affects 
everyone and is perpetrated by everyone. But those far right movements, you know, really capitalized on particular scandals. So that I, I'll stop talking there in case like, you know, to let you get a, a, a word in, because I'm sure you have thoughts about this. But it's essentially what I'm seeing is misogyny in both movements. It's directed outwards to other women that they deem unsuitable, wrong, that whose behaviours need to be changed, but also towards their own women who need to be controlled. These are the good women. These are the women who believe the right things, but even they are not immune from being policed and controlled. Uh, and uh, you covered what I wanted to ask you, one of the questions. And so I'll jump into the other part of it, because it's uh, while you're mentioning this, uh, I wanted to understand that how much of local context and gender norms influence the pathways into extremist groups, especially the creation of boundaries and differentiation between individuals within these groups. You know, the narratives that are enhanced by participants. What, one of the sort of difficult things about doing a book about extreme Britain is that, you know, what extremism is, is really not clear. You know, and you, you'll be aware that the government has just recently, you know, brought out a new definition. We've had a lot of discussion over the years of how the extremism definition was too big, too vague, it included too many people. It's not clear about which people it should be including, you know. So in the book, I mention uh, a, a really important definition that uh, a colleague, a US scholar called J.M. Berger came up with. And he talks about this important idea of, in you know, that social identity theory, in-group, out-group, and the idea that your group can only survive if that other group is not surviving and that you're engaged in hostile action against that other group. And what I could see is that, you know, I'm talking to people about their whole lives. So I'm saying, look, tell me how you got into this group. What, what happened, you know? And they might start in childhood or they might start, you know, when they were um, doing their exams or they might start when they got arrested for something when they were 20. They might start any place. But I'm basically asking them to tell me what they think is important. And for all, all of the people in the far right, they're talking about place and they're talking about how they first, you know, identify their in-group and, and the importance, as I said, of gender norms, of sexual norms, of women's behaviour and clothing in those initial um, feelings, and they are feelings, about who is in their group and who is not. And there's a feeling of pride in in-group, but a feeling of that pride being dented by those people in the out-group. Those people in the out-group are reducing your ability to have pride in your in-group, <coughs> which is, you know, which was interesting because they're all saying this. So, so gender becomes, for me, it's really formative in creating those boundaries, those in-group, out-group boundaries that are just the, built, the first building block of extremism. And what you see when I was talking to the Islamist actors was the same thing happening, you know, but here they've got a different sense of, for them, it's not about women being, you know, it's again, it's about what women are wearing. It's about this time, it's the clothes are too short. Um, and they are all telling me also that they are, they are um, integrated. They are living these secular lives before they join Anjan Chowdhury's group. They've got jobs, they've got girlfriends, they go clubbing. They're doing these things, but the whole time they've got this kind of internal monologue that says you shouldn't be doing this. This isn't not right. And that monologue is a gendered monologue, and it is judging and critiquing them and their behaviours on a long gendered lines. You know, you've taken off your hijab to work in your father's restaurant. Well, that's not right. What will that other Bengalis in the kitchen think? You know, but you're doing it. Um, you're going to a nightclub and you see your brother there. Well, that's not right. He should be telling you you should be going home if you were like a good family. So there's this constant tension and it's a gendered tension for those Islamist actors. Well, at this point, they're not Islamist. And when they join the group, they just resolve that tension. It's gone because now they know that the right thing all along was to, to be that person, to be that good Muslim that they always felt that they were letting down when they were um, assimilating into British life by engaging in these behaviours they never felt totally comfortable about. 
So that was where that sort of those boundaries come in and, and gender comes into those that very first beginnings of extremism. You're talking about uh, this. I just wanted to ask you because uh, in a most you know traditional CT perspective, a counterterrorism perspective, uh, the idea of deterring these groups come first, and not often the gender dynamics within these groups come into conversation. Uh, and do you think that's kind of problematic in a traditional CT perspective to not have the gender dynamics and how women are treated within outside the groups? Yeah, I do. And, you know, I think that the, um, you know, recent events have really shown that we do need to think about gender. You know, um, look at Islamic State, as I mentioned, you know, in 2014, 2015, they're encouraging women from all over the world to travel there. And, you know, this takes a lot of counterterrorism experts by surprise. You know, oh, why they invite, you know, we've not seen this before. Well, we hadn't seen that before because we hadn't seen um, Islamist groups setting out to attract an international cohort to their new state, their new caliphate. Um, but what was important here was that you know, you can't have a state without men and women and that there's a very distinct roles for them and they mirror the ideologies of Islamist groups. And we've always seen that. Um, we've seen, you know, elevation of fighters, elevation of um, Islam Islamist ideological scholars. Um, and we've seen women, you know, being in the home in a, many other groups, but they haven't been visible because they haven't been getting on planes and traveling, you know, in the way that, you know, suddenly caught out a lot of Western governments for sure, but other governments too. And after that, you think, well, you know, women who've been working on, on gender for a while, we think, well, now, you know, they've got to kind of look at gender in these, look at all the propaganda. It's all completely gendered. You know, look at the images that they're trying to sell to young men to get them over to Islamic State. Look at the images that they're trying to sell to young women to get them over to Islamic State. Highly gendered, totally different for men and women. So it's just recognizing that there is difference between men and women and their radicalizations and that that matters, that that is fundamental and integral to those um, to those groups. Also, I don't want us to take men's violence for granted. I'm not saying in extreme Britain, it's it's all men's fault. Okay, these groups are like dominated by men. What I'm trying to do is understand those relations, those gendered relations between men and women and the ways in which masculinities are done by men, gain men's status, but also gain women's status in groups because they can do. You look at... Um, Islamic State, I'm using Islamic State again uh, as an ideology. You look at the far right ideologies. Again, we've got gender divisions. They're not the same in every group, but we've got them. Um, you look at pro-Russian extremism. You look at incel, misogynistic incel extremism. And you see they, these ideologies layering onto each other. They are versions of similar things. And gender dynamics are really important to them. And it seems to me if you've got a problem like incels, if you've got a problem like Islamic State, if you've got a problem like the far right, if you're not trying to understand what is drawing in men and women and how that is different, if you're not looking at gender, then you're not fully understanding what those groups are and, and what they're doing. And I cannot, I can't understand why anybody who is interested in terrorism or extremism or is an analyst in this field wouldn't be interested in this because I'm not just doing it because I'm a woman and I love gender and oh, it's my brand and uh, let's tick a box here. It's because it tells us something fundamental about those groups, right? And if we don't understand them wholly fundamentally, then how can we possibly hope to stop them, challenge them and to stop divisions in our societies and violence? I just don't see that we can. But, you know, we've also got misogyny and uh, lack of gender analysis and awareness in the institutions that are, you know, tasked with doing this. So it's not just about the groups, it's about it's about the institutions, it's about governments which are unequal and sexist and patriarchal. Um, you know, so we've got, we've got a lot of work to, work to do if we're interested in gender in this space. But we're trying our best to, to get the messages out there, I hope, I think. Uh, I When I was reading the book, I realised one of the challenges that, as an academic, you might have faced, Often, because I also come from media and now I work in the uh, research space, I could understand the same problem 
or the challenge that we always have to define and understand the concept and one of the concept that you tried explaining is the white working class uh, could you explain it in the relation to the extremist movement like the edl and britain first and was it a challenge to define terms like these in your book yeah it's a it's a really important question because this this whole area of research is you know inevitably incredibly politicized and it's quite risky to do this work for me and also it's risky for me personally but it's risky in terms of that researcher um objective which is do no harm right nobody wants to do harm with their research the last thing that you want to do is unproblematically and uncritically reproduce harmful narratives particularly when those are narratives of white supremacy and you are a uh white researcher in this field right so now the the term white working class is is a really contested term it's really hard to define um i mean i i hope no one would co- would counter me or challenge me when you say when i say the uk and great britain at the moment is an incredibly still class based society it's still riven with inequalities um and those inequalities are spread across demographics right you know so um the term working class it doesn't mean what it used to mean you know we used to be an industrial nation and working class meant you know doing a particular type of work and you know yes there was a pride in it you know say in the 1950s 1960s the term as i use it in this book is really to help the reader understand the claims of the far right groups that i'm talking to so I, i don't take that term at face value the people that i'm speaking to in the far right say they are white working class this is their claim now this is they can't speak for a white working class they're not but it's their claim many white people who grew up in the same places as them who didn't have much money who have socioeconomic hardships who um have a number of complex social issues would not and do not support the english defence league britain first or any other anti islam groups right Let, let's just say that but in these groups that identity white working class is a clarion call it is part of their radicalization narrative and so i had to discuss it and i had to include it because it's absolutely central to what they think is happening so that there are people who have got a sense of a sense of entitlement a sense of where they should be and they do not believe they are where they should be and they believe that is because white liberal elites you know i guess people like me um but people in policy people in power don't understand them look down on them denigrate them and put uh immigrant working class people above them in a hierarchy and not just immigrant but you know uh, immigrants uh, who are people of color so so whiteness race comes into this ethnicity so there's a there's this it's a it's a sense of failed in, in entitlement that that they have so that term you know i don't use it easily and i certainly don't want to contribute to um narratives of you know there are left behind people in this book there's no doubt about that right but i don't want to contribute to narrative of oh the white working class is so left behind that's the problem here you know there is a lot of inequality in british society austerity covid you know in in my view the actions of this current government have been devastating for many sections of british society um including british muslims i would say but you have to engage with it because it's absolutely part of their identity and that's crucial to understanding radicalization and to their radicalization narratives about the white working class as second class citizens so you know but it's not an easy thing to engage with and you know const- my constant worry was am i doing harm am i perpetuating harmful narratives through this book and i can only hope that the reader will judge for themselves you know whether i've struck the right tone in you know in doing this research um in writing about this and reflecting on this research and i spend a chapter of the book kind of writing about the difficulties and complexities of um the methodology and and getting this right ethically then we'll be probably some people who who don't think it's all right to speak to extremists and who don't think it's all right to write about them in the way that i have 
but you know I've just I've done the best that I could in order to represent what I think is a is a real problem an ongoing problem in British society in a way that I hope is fair to my participants because they gave me their time and I did try and empathize with them and I did want to listen to them and understand them I can't hide from the fact that their views are harmful divisive problematic but it's not all about bad people doing you know bad things everyone can change there's some complex structural issues at play here in terms of what's happening in British society and uh, and if I could just ask you one last thing that who should read the book actually because in India uh, the problem is that a lot of people do want to read uh, about terrorism studies and if you know the problem here is uh, not a lot about is written uh, from an academic perspective it's mostly written from a very city perspective Well, <laughs> I mean, thank you, Ratnajit, for picking up this book and reading it. Um, I hope that, you know, I hope that people who want to understand, you know, it's about Britain. Um, this is an image from Britain. But I think it has lessons for parallels with many other different countries. You know, it's context specific, but there are lessons to be drawn from this. I hope that it's readable, not just for academics, but for people who are interested in the kinds of justifications that extremists give, the kind of lives that they have, who want to find out something about those people. Um, I hope that people who are active practitioners, I hope that students, you know, I know that uh, a lot of uh, women who are engaged in gender studies are reading it and are interested in it. Fantastic. I'd, you know, I'd like it to go beyond the audience, which is my my people, if you like, the sort of gender scholar type people. And, you know, I'm told that it's readable for an academic book that, you know, one of my friends read it on a train journey. So uh, that, that boded well. But, I, you know, I hope that it is widely read. And I hope that those people who gave me their time to contribute to this, I hope that their stories will be taken on board by many different people and you know there is some resonance also with you know particularly in the Islamist stories they reflect on their heritage they reflect on you know and also in the far right you know we've got Polish people we've got this isn't just a British story this is a story that is about people from actually a number of different countries and backgrounds and how they manage living those lives in a British context so No, I hope that uh, people who've never been interested in gender before will read this, as well as those who are interested in gender and terrorism and extremism. That's my hope. Well, I'm sure that people will do pick up a copy. We'll just link the description to buy the book in our description. So thank you so much uh, for taking your time and speaking to us. No, thanks. It's been really interesting and appreciate your interest in, in the book. It's it's really delight, delighting to, to hear that you read this and that you enjoyed it. And your questions have been absolutely fantastic. Thank you.